Okay, so welcome again to Introduction to Criminal Justice, Dr. Clay. Today we're discussing conceptualizing criminal law. All right, and so I kind of go a little off script here from your, your, your textbook because you can't really have a criminal justice system until you have criminal law. So my goal for today is to help you understand what the criminal law kind of is from a conceptual basis. Next class, we'll look at some crimes. And what you're actually getting is you're getting previews of different classes in the criminal justice major. Right? So last class was just an introductory class. Right? And we went through just kind of the basics of um, the criminal justice system. So covering everything from branch of the government, to the structure of the criminal justice system, to we talked about statistics, we talked about practical models, due process models. All this stuff. That's giving you set up for the classes that we have. All right? And the classes that we have all went back into the different courses that we offer. And so one of the things that should be getting today would be like an offering one of my first days in criminal law one. When we start to kind of think about what the law is before I make you know the law. Next class, you'll learn some of the criminal laws. Not all of them. You can't know all of them. They are a ridiculous number, but you'll get the big ones. All right, so today we're just laying that foundation. So, before we get too into it, I wanted to post a couple critical discussion questions, right? Things for you to ponder in terms of the law, right? So, what would society be like if there was no law? Take Hobbes even knew. Hobbes said it would be a state of utter chaos. Right? Life would be nasty, brutal, and short. Or you can take John Locke's view that society would be perfect. We didn't have laws. Right? We didn't even have like a even the overarching inclusion society, right? That we would learn to live only with each other. Right? Because we would be responsible for doing justice for ourselves. Like obviously there are problems with that. Think about what if there was no law, right? And I know always reference the curve. Um I was thinking of the law for a couple hours. Um do you think what would what would happen realistically if we said all laws are now suspended? What do you think of the trajectory of, of this movie? This is the interactive portion of class. Yeah, so if we suspended all laws, what do you think that would look like? Say again? The birch? Okay. Yes, the answer is yes. More than those, the property mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I think it'd be pretty similar to how it's like totally different. Like, I'm 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 like, i but I see it as being unbelievably violent for about four weeks. And then after that, people realize they have to resume the law. They have to resume working because we are not hunters and gatherers anymore. Right? Um, I drop some of you in the middle of the woods, you're going to die. So I, we realize that we'll have to start forming at least some working relationships, some rules, because Yes, it was violent and like you got to kill everyone that you've always wanted to kill. So you know, we have to decrease population, which is nice, it opens up jobs, job opportunities. But you're gonna have to re-socialize at some point. Because again, we're not under the water, right? We lost that uh, trait within us. 
So let's just look at this the starting off. Um, from this, right, and this is the design stage, is, is there such a thing as a instinctual right and an instinctual wrong? Right, so it's something inherently wrong, something we would not need the criminal law for to tell us is wrong. And would that hold us back if we didn't have laws? Shake your hand, yeah. Let me go with this. Is there any conduct that's universally appropriate? Basically, every civilization, right, regardless of how um, organic, how, how, how uh, remote and removed they are, maybe from the first world, you know, think about like the tribes, probably the game, things along the way. Is there one criminal law that's in every single culture? Does that tell us if something was instinctual or not? Right? Yeah. Murder. Murder. Don't we have ways around that now? Yeah. Right? Taking the life of a human being is wrong. Comma, but. Right? Comma, but. We thought taking life of the human being was wrong. It should be wrong with all the past. Right? But we make exceptions. Lots of exceptions. So, yeah, you would think murder, that's one we a lot of people go to. One that I always think of is incest. But there are people that practice incest. Right? There are tribes that practice ancestral relations. So, Something as gross, like feeling and like having sex with your sibling, as nasty and ugh as that is, from our perspective, from another perspective, it's perfectly normal. It's how the life of the tribe or the life of the family continues. Right? So, again, yeah, there, there are cultures that do practice sex. And we think about Natural law, right? This would be natural law. Um, it's wrong just to be wrong. Where is the wrong in itself? We look to the animal thing. Right? Like, this is one that always, always gets me when we talk about the uh, marriage equality arguments. One thing that was never brought up a zookeeper never filed a brief. Animals practice homosexuality, they practice incest, animals kill. So why not to the animal kingdom? See if there's any natural laws there. Because theoretically, if there's something that's completely right or completely wrong, we should have it across all species, across all peoples, no exceptions, it's wrong because it's wrong. Well, so that tells us, in fact, it informs us of why are some harmful acts permitted and some prohibited. Well, it's how we evolved as a society, right? We look at leaders who we say, instinctually, I believe this, or because, because of my religion, I believe this. And so we made some stuff prohibited, some stuff we allow. Think about smoking, again. New York, you have to be 21, you have to be 18. We all agree that's bad, right? Like nobody's like, hey, Health benefits of smoking. No, like they, it's universally known as bad. We know that it's probably going to kill you, but we allow it anyway. Somebody with, if they saw off a shotgun, it's a federal offense. We don't allow you to have a off shotgun. Why is one allowed and one not allowed? Again, is this kind of political mesh and how we evolve as a society? Right? It's one of these questions that you can just overarching look at. And say, how? How did this come to fruition? How did we get to this point? There was a time where buildings didn't exist, right? where we lived in caves. 
We beat each other in the head with rocks. We got eaten by fucking dinosaurs. I don't know. Not a historian. But that's where we're at. Right? So again, yeah, this is just some philosophical kind of other kind of questions that you probably get from law and society. Um, where you write long philosophical arguments about, and then at the end realize, I just wrote a little page of it. Do it again. So let's get to stuff that does matter. All right? So if we look at again kind of philosophical perspective of the law, this first definition derives from your book. Right? Definition suggests that crime is a violation of generally accepted set of rules that are backed by the power and the authority of the state. All right. That being said, the source of these rules is a matter of philosophy, something that we can't just engage in. All right. So when we're thinking about laws, one of the terms that you saw and we kind of played around with just a little bit was natural law. Right, natural law is a body of principles and rules imposed on individuals by some extra human power or some extra human power being on a community of rational beings. Right, so when we look at natural law, we say, okay, there's some force. Some people call it God, some people call it nature, whatever it is, there's some force. That makes us generally agree on certain things that we should do and shouldn't do. Right? That's what I'm talking about natural law. That being said, researchers for the most part have concluded that there is no universally prohibited activities across all society. So, like, if you really want to go, like, make love to your sibling, there is a society for you. We can find you, we can get you on a plane, fuck out of here. Um, oh. But you have a place. Right? There's no universally prohibited activities. Right? So, and think about when we talk about people who hate incest, right? It's the best basis of the definition parent versus child, brother versus sister. A lot of times when it came to royalty, we did this in matter of necessity. Like those of you who watch Game of Thrones, like, I can see part of it. I got the dragons and all the other cool dragons. And then there's just some fun characters to keep track of. And I was like, oh, I don't know what, what the fuck's going on over here now? Like, there's too much of it. And my girlfriend at the time had to explain it to me, like, every, every before every show. So next like, this is what happened, this is what's going on, and I'm like, she was like, oh yeah, Targaryen. And I'm like, I don't fucking know who that is. So they were not saying that that was fun. But I remember there was like a lot of like sex. I was like, this is basically stock sports on um, that we just broadcasted. It's really in depth shit. Um, but what else do you have that place? All right, brothers and sisters have married, right? Have kids. To keep the lineage going, to keep the kingdom running, to make treaties, to make peace, whatever it is. That being said, we do have traces of what we would consider natural law to the oldest known legal code. The oldest known legal code is the Code of Morado. It dates back to 1700 BC. It has some basic principles. Right? It has some principles that, that we have talked about first then had gut reaction. Murder is on. Um, robbery is on there. There's a lot of religious offenses that are on there. So if you're very, very interested, we have to come home. Right? It's our own single code. And yet we still keep commonalities. So we're saying maybe as an evolving society, we're getting to a point where we all agree on stuff, but not every society is there yet. And maybe 2,000 years from now, that society will be there in terms of their agreements on what's right and what's wrong. 
we think of it from this Western perspective of what's right and what's wrong. Right? Generally speaking, we think of it from this, and then obviously all of your privilege because you're in college, right? That's a big, big mark of privilege. We have that background, right? So we can say what's right and what's wrong. And we look down on others who practice things that we don't believe are right or wrong. But maybe they're not there yet. Right? Maybe they're not there yet. So there may be natural law. We may one day all agree on the same thing. But it's going to take a very long time. So, because there is a lack of consistency or universality of agreed upon law, right? Or at least agree upon evidence of some kind of extra human natural law, right? Composed on God or nature or whomever. Because we lack consistency, we generally consider law to be a human construct. Right? Humans did this. As such, being a human construct is a social issue. Right? The law consists of rules created in response to behavior perceived as harmful to society, right? So that's all the law is, is we agree that behavior X hurts our society in some way. So we outlaw it. Or we may just look heavily down upon it, right? So one thing that we have to keep in mind is there is a difference between deviance and crime. Right? So we consider something deviant to be, for example, I'll give up here, is alcoholism. Right? Deviant has a very negative connotation to it, but it's meaning you're deviating from the norm. Right? There's no real implicit judgment there, at least there shouldn't be any implicit judgment there, but we're saying you're deviating from the norm. We as a society don't like when people deviate from the norm. We don't like what that you're an alcoholic, but we'll allow it. Trust me, we tried to outlaw alcoholism. It didn't go well. So we allow it. However, we say if you're going to be an alcoholic, that's fine. We don't agree with it. We don't like it. We're going to try to get you to stop, but do it in the privacy of your own home. So the minute you step foot in public and you're intoxicated, then you cause harm to society, or you run the risk of causing harm to society. Or think about this, like an alcoholic sitting at home by himself. This is where I see myself in a few years. Just drinking, surrounded by cats, watching the TV, talking to it like it was my best friend. I'm not talking in that case. Am I hurting a moral fabric of society? Am I hurting anybody in society besides myself? No. But as soon as I like maybe go to the store and get more cat food or whatever, alcohol and cat food, I step foot in society and I'm drunk. Now do I have the probability of potentially to hurt someone or hurt the moral fabric of society? Yeah. Like, I wish Elmira was a college guy. You can still do. Um, so you can get the full college experience. Um, before teaching here at the University of Alabama, right off the University of Alabama, guess what it was surrounded by? I mean, like, the University of Alabama's campus is massive. Right? As much as, like, we degrade Alabama for being Alabama, um, its university is actually one of the hardest public universities to get into in the country. It is an amazing campus, amazing football team will tie with the one true God, Nick Saban, leading the side to victory. So yes, come this fall, if the Crimson Tide does not do well, and then it actually replays, you will be punished. I don't know how yet, but I'm very vindictive. I blame you because you did not believe hard enough that the Crimson Tide could pull this off. So, back to my lecture. 
do I have a propensity of hurting somebody as soon as I step outside drop? Right? So and again, going back to the college and idea, why not campus? Why not campus? Like three blocks from my office, campus ended. And then you had fraternity row on one side and 39 different bars on the other side. All right, so where would you find your students if they weren't in class? Down there. Uh, in fact, one day, I, I, my law and society class, we had a couple people missing. I was like, you know what? Field trip today. We went to the bars to find them, and we fucking found them. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem there is, let's say you get drunk down like Trinity Row down by the bars. Publicly intoxicated. Are you causing harm now? I mean, a lot of people are intoxicated. Right? So, I mean, does public intoxication really hurt people? Not necessarily in and of itself, but it increases the propensity that's going to harm someone. Breaking your own, you don't harm yourself, it harms somebody else. Breaking outside, DUI, breaking, uh, sorry, fights. I mean, the police were always, I mean, they would just, they would live there. They knew that most of the people drinking were under 21. They didn't care. They were just there to stop fights and peace. All right, so again, that's where we see the intoxicating. But so that being said, since crime is a social construct, we have to know that it's different from deviance to crime and is subject and principled on moral principles and judgments, which means it's subject to change. Right? As a result, definitions of what crime is vary greatly. Right? Again, think about it. It's subject to change. What was criminal? Let's see. 2006? Texas had a lot of the books um, that was finally struck down by the United States Supreme Court. It had to go all the way to the United States Supreme Court, which made it illegal to commit sodomy. Even if it was consensual. Johnson, 2006. And the story behind it is a great case. Like, the cops get a call, there's a shooting, and they, there were guns, there were gunshots, so they respond to where this person in college had the gunshots are coming from. And of course, they go in, right, ready to take a person down, ready to see the threat. Um, at first, they hold off like they're going to negotiate, but then they hear screams inside, or so they think. So, Popo knocks down the door. And lo and behold, right in front of them are two guys having sex. I would love to see that piece of Because presumably, like the moaning of the stuff right there, yeah. Um, and for really the first time um, in modern history, the police made an arrest. They arrested the man, the men. Under the sodomy law. Who got stuck with that dude? Like, put the cuss on the naked dude. Like, you don't want that dude? But somebody had to. Right? I mean, in all fairness, like, the police were fairly chill about it. They were like, get dressed and stuff. Um, but it goes on the Supreme Court. So, until 2016, when we said consensual sex. Is legal. Right? So, again, as society changes and evolves, right? it was kind of a no brainer for most of us. We're like, even if you don't necessarily agree with homosexuality, whether that's your religious beliefs or that's your personal beliefs, whatever, you don't necessarily want to see like people go to prison for it. Right? That's, again, a mark of a changing society. Because at some point, we wanted to see people go to prison for it. 
right? So again, it, it, it's subject to change and it changes across time and location. So, that being said, in the United States, if we're looking at what the law really is, is to us, American society has said there are really three basic sources of law. Right, the first basic source of law is statutory law. So these are what you think, laws and statutes. This is what Congress has passed. This is what the state assembly has passed. These are physical laws. Then we have case law. It is law that results from interpretations of statutes. Right? So basically, when somebody gets an arrest, right? Take the Texas case. Or in this case, Robinson v. California. If you want to look up the an interesting case where we tried to make a criminal be an alcoholic, that's where we have Robinson v. California. Um, they were interpreting a statute that basically said it was a prohibition on being an alcoholic uh, or being an alcoholic. And they go here and they arrest Robinson because they know he's an alcoholic. And then you go through the criminal justice system, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, okay, you can't criminalize somebody for a condition. Right? Being an alcoholic is a condition. You can't criminalize somebody. But you can criminalize any conduct that they do related to it. Right? So again, being drunk in public. That's where Robinson comes into play. So it's not criminal to be a drug addict. However, it is criminal to buy drugs. And so, yeah, we can't criminalize if you're a disease or a state of being. We can criminalize things that lead to a perpetuated continuum. And then the last thing that we have, kind of goes hand in hand with case law, is common law. So, common law are customs and traditions, maybe very early judicial decisions, maybe English decisions. Um, that guides courts in decision making. So we look and say, okay, we're interpreting the Constitution. We know the Constitution when it was written, when it was ratified. Uh, let's look at kind of what did we do at the time, or what was the law in England at the time? Because we were all English, right? So, like, what was the law in England? That's common law. Common law now kind of encompasses case law, but they kind of refer to each other because case law are just judicial decisions, right? So case law kind of comes down and becomes part of the common law. Again, this is based on customs and traditions. That being said, we're also guided by one principle when we are constructing laws. No crimen sin pena. No crime without punishment. Right, so basically what this dictates is for basic law, a law must be written. You have to have it written down somewhere. Okay. Persons cannot be tried for acts that are not criminal. So you can't be like, well, it's not in the law, but like, that was a really shitty thing to do. Arrest them, we'll just have a trial. Like, no, you have to be able to know what the law is in advance. You can't try somebody without a written law. And a person cannot be punished for an act that the law does not provide a penalty. This has happened a few times in the United States where we have the best intentions of passing a decent law, but we forget to include they can be punished by. So it's only looking at this. You arrest for it, you try for it, you found guilty. And then the judge is like, huh, well, under statute, it's not, there's no punishment. It doesn't say anywhere in this statute what the punishment should be, should be. So we have to let you go. All right? So yeah, it's kind of these two steps. Right? The, 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 the law has to be written. You can't be tried for something that hasn't been written down. And you can't get punished for something for which the law doesn't provide a penalty, including not being written down. So, 
now we're going to start getting into law school law. Right? So if we look at defining crime, the first thing that we look at when we define what a crime is in the United States is the actus reus. Right, the actus reus. Actus reus is an intentional act or omission in violation of criminal law, statutory and case law included, committed without a defense or justification and sanctioned by the state as a felony or misdemeanor. All right, that's the textual definition of crime. And what we're going to do is we're going to break this definition down almost word by word, understanding what crime is. All right, so again, we begin with an intentional act or omission. This is actus reus. So we look at the definition of requirements of crime, we say the actus reus, commission of an act that is legally forbidden, or the omission of an act that is legally required. All right, so this is kind of where we're starting our, our requirements of the crime. First thing, actus reus. Right? Has to be legally forbidden, or you have to do it. So most people think that if they don't do anything, it's not a crime. Not true. If you have a kid and you don't feed it, that omission we consider an act. All right, so the failure to act can be an act in and of itself. Welcome to the law. Right? So the fact that you didn't do something that you were supposed to do constitutes an act. You didn't send in. That's current. That's an act. Usually we require some kind of special relationship. Right? If somebody's in your care, this is usually like a child in the parents' care. It may be an adult with developmental disabilities, like in the care of a group home, in the care of a, a, a personal baby. Right? We say, look, omission is the same thing as that. Right, so just because you didn't do something physically doesn't mean you're not committing an act. That being said, if we look at the here at the definition of crime, we see from our definition of our actual space that merely thinking about crime is insufficient. At various points during this class, and probably even today, you've dreamed about killing me in one way or another. I was a college student, like every professor that I was like, I would just go to class just to like, get a couple of things done. But like, just thinking about killing not a crime. Let's go for it. Um, like, don't, don't like, follow through, but like, think about it. Go nuts. All right, it gets where it gets you through the day. And that being said, as we'll see later, a final act is not always required for a crime. All right, so what I mean by this is, let's say we go from thinking about killing me, you go about thinking about killing me, you find out that your friend also wants to kill me. And you start joking, you're like, huh, you lead him in the library, I'll take out the chainsaw. But like, at that point, have they broken the law? The answer is yes. They're no longer thinking about it. Now they're verbalizing it and making plans. Right? And what is making a plan? An act. Verbalizing it? An act. And so keep your thoughts in your head. Don't let stuff just slip out of your mouth. Keep them up there. Up here, legal. Down here, illegal. And so that kind of gets us to what we started to look at. First time of crime by the actus reus. Then we get into the more complicated mens rea. Right? So this is the second requirement for a crime. First requirement, we have an act or omission. Second requirement, we've met the mens rea. Mens rea basically 
uh, translates into a blameworthy or evil mind. All right, so our second requirement is for an act of omission to be criminal, the law requires the presence of a blameworthy or evil mind. We normally refer to this as intent. Right? Morally blameworthy, morally evil, intentional. Because we would probably safe to assume that it's different or should be treated differently if I'm walking through the library parking lot and you run me over and you intended to do it versus you just didn't see me and it was an accident. Right? We're going to have two very different responses because of your mindset. Right? Where was your mind? Are you a danger to society? Like, were you thinking about doing it? Or did it just accidentally happen? So that being said, this is premised on something that fundamentally bothers me about the law. It's premised on the belief that people are rational. That's, that's the first problem. People are rational. They're rational human beings, quasi four seven who, before doing anything, weigh the pros and the cons of doing that act. But we assume in the law, if you're going to murder somebody, here's an out piece of paper and a pen, and you're going to write a pros and cons list. And if there's more pros than cons, then you're going to kill somebody. But if there's more cons than pros, you won't kill somebody. This is the foundation of American law. So, like, if you go out under a drinking, we assume under the law that you have basically sat down, sat, you basically sat down, and made a first cons list about drinking underage before you go out and actually do it. Let me say that again. I work with a lot of clients in the past. Um, one may have been rational, but most of them weren't. Like most of them, you looked at their crime and you went, the fuck were you thinking? Right? And we think that out loud and we say, hey, that person's not rational. But we assume rationality. Regardless of how ridiculous your crime is, unless you plead insanity, but regardless of how ridiculous it is or how it's really, what? Why don't you do that? We say, no, the person's a rational being. They made a rational choice. That's fine. Um, this is, gets really, really problematic when we talk about the jaded lover scenario. Jaded lover scenario is a man comes home, finds his wife in bed with another man. In a blinding white rage, he goes to the nightstand, grabs the gun, shoots and kills them both. The question is, what would be a rational human being? Like in that situation, nobody's rational. Like, just, no. But we have to go through a full criminal process before we can even touch rationality. All right, so again, you're presumed to be rational. That being said, there are two types of intent, right? And where we refer to intent, there's two forms, and then there's a subtype. So we have specific intent. Specific intent is when the offender, the criminal, desired the result. Right? Like the result was prohibited, obviously, by law. They desired that to occur. And so I desire that Dr. Clay dies. I heard some laughs over there, and that kind of scares me. Some of you are like, yeah, yeah. You're like fair, fair enough. But you know, that's the result that I want. Then we have general intent, right? And general intent's a little bit more vague and a little bit more fluffy. The offender engages in conscious wrongdoing from which a prohibited act results follow, um, even if the offender did not desire the result. So what is this? This is engaging in conscious wrongdoing from which a prohibited result follows, even if the offender does not desire the result. You want to kill me, 
but your aim is bad, you kill Dr. Linhart. Specific intent was to kill me. Is it the crime to kill Dr. Linhart? We look at specific intent versus general intent. And there are specific intent crimes and there are general intent crimes. We won't get way into it. Do you have a clip from a law school? But you'll see that I have all kinds of weird scenarios and fact patterns and all kinds of fun gaps. Um, but again, in some situations, this is something that you definitely need to take note of. You don't know by now. There is no criminal intent required for certain offenses. So for certain offenses, the act itself is enough. We don't care what you were thinking, does not matter where your heart was. Did you do it? Did you not do it? It's called strict liability. Strict liability offenses. Probably the best known strict liability offense, statutory rape. Statutory rape, if you're not in a Romeo and Juliet state, basically says, once you move 18, if you have sex with, let's say, your 17, 16 year old girlfriend, or vice versa, you have de facto committed statutory rape. Romeo and Juliet say that the same thing like two or three years of each other. Like, they're like high school kids. All they do is like try to have sex. Like, they're all these two have sex. We understand the age group. I mean, we understand where you're at. Um, so there's there's bits of modifications in your law. But still, statutory rape presents that let's say you are going to the bar and you start talking to the guy. You're important. And you're like, okay, I know where this is headed, right? You both can avert the consent to this. Here's paperwork we're gonna sign. I know we're consenting to it. But before um, we can actually engage in the active population, I'm going to need to see your driver's license and your passport. And lo and behold, the date provides his driver's license and his passport. Can you check them? They both look harder. Do you have any black light? Do you do all the little cool tricks to them? They're both genuine. They both say that person is 18 years of age. You engage in sexual relations with said person. Said person wakes up the next morning, looks out where he goes, huh, I'm only 17. And then you go, in your mind, fuck. Because you've just committed statutory rape. Right? Um, and in prison, uh, rapists don't get treated well. And this one aren't necessarily the most bright. Um, they don't necessarily try to understand and learn the definitions of strict liability. Like, you can't explain it to them. Like, they're, they're like, you're here for rape. Like, you're going to die. Um, so, yeah, just get out of the back of your mind, especially if you're a freshman. Um, you have to go from my home, you might go here, get people graduate early from school, so don't just face your thing and all of that. You got strict liability, we'll get you. Everybody. Remember, it's not up to the victim to press charges, it's the state. Right? So, again, always ask for passports, driver's licenses, give me checks, and you're fine. It's very romantic. That's fine. Okay, maybe you're going to go back to my place? Sure, but we'll stop by my safety box, but we give a Like, doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. So, that being said, there are four levels of intent. All right, so we got general specific, and then we have four levels underneath it. These levels are purposely, knowingly, recklessly, and negligent. All right, each refers to a certain mindset. Purposefully, and, and it goes in order of severity, right? The lower down the list you are, the less severe the crime is, the less severe the sanction will be, even or even if we decided to charge it as a crime. All right, so the first one is purposely. Purposely, the individual 
and a definite purpose and a strong desire to achieve this purpose. Okay. So, think about somebody comes in here with a gun. Puts the gun in my head. I should now compare them. What's the? Uh, I give all a bunch of giggle glasses. I'm going to die. So, you're going to die. What's your name? Jordan. All right, so somebody comes in here and never just hears on Jordan. They're like, I like people who giggle when you're about to play something you're going to die. And they say, I want you to die. Put the gun to her head, pull the trigger, and kill Jordan. That's purpose -like. They might even say, my purpose is to kill Jordan. All right, what else would you be doing with a gun? Like, you can't argue that it was an accident. You put a gun against a temple, took the safety off, and pulled the trigger. What did you think was going to happen? So that's purposeful. Knowingly is great. Because knowingly is a little less serious, a little bit more difficult to understand. And knowingly, you're all but certain. Keep that mind. We're all but certain that your actions will result in harm or violation. All right? So Let's say that I've come in here. This is actually a pretty decent sized class. I've had people from one arts class ask me to join, so. Um, I can't even do that. Um, we have a decent sized class. Let's say the gun comes in. Nothing else goes down. Go down. Jordan's the gun in this time. So Jordan comes in, she's going to shoot you. Alright? And she's. He's kind of walking back and forth with the gun in front of the class. And then looking at how packed this is, and even with our, our social distancing, she says, you know what I know? I'm gonna close my eyes. And she closes her eyes. Says, I hope this doesn't kill anyone. And then just starts firing randomly with her eyes closed at you all. This is a pretty packed place. Is Jordan all but certain that somebody's going to get injured or killed? And like, I mean, again, somebody can get hit. But that's all but certain. Jordan decides to be reckless, right? This is where there's a very fine line. Jordan comes in, never having owned a gun before. Right? Never having owned a gun before, but is fully aware of what guns do. So, let's say that this crowd is reduced by three fourths. So there's only one fourth of you, and you're all spread out. Here's what the gun does. Never owned one before, never held one before. Maybe she gets up here, gives some kind of speech, or whatever. She gets up here, and then. And it's just waving the gun around, having a good old luck. Just talk, right? The fourth of you here, bang! She didn't mean to do it. But, somebody got hit. And they die. Yes, Jordan is a murderer. Please refer to her as such for the rest of the time. So, in that case, was Jordan all but certain, all but certain that she was going to hit somebody but with her gun? No. Right, a packed room? Sure, you're going to hit someone. Fourth of you guys all spread out? You're not all but certain. Is it likely? Maybe. That's not all that's certain, right? All that's certain is like, I am basically guaranteed this is going to happen. I'm not guaranteed it's going to happen, but I'm still kind of in that reckless stage, that, 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 that mind frame where I'm not guaranteed it's going to hit somebody, but you know, probably, probably it's not guaranteed. Right? So recklessly, is definitely a little bit of a problem. 
right? And what we're looking at here specifically is the individual should have known that his or her actions were putting someone at risk, but did not care. Right? Should have known, but did not care. Reckless, like Jordan's being reckless. She should have known because she never had a gun before, but she knows what they do. She should have known that if you're going off and handling the safety off and, and, and you have it to you, you should know you're done, and she pulled the trigger and killed someone. She should have known. She didn't care. How do we know she didn't care? She fucking did it. That brings us to negligence. And when we think negligence, usually we think civil lawsuits. That's like the definition of a civil lawsuit, right? It is somebody who's being negligent. Well, negligence has, there is a, a version of negligence, criminal negligence, that is basically the same standard. In this case, the individual should have known, someone directly should have known, that his or her actions were putting someone at risk but they didn't know. All right, so again, I see the door coming in. Maybe somebody gave her a concussion. She, all of her memory is gone. Uh, she walks in and somebody hands her a gun. And they're like, there was a concussion and a gun. She's never held a gun before. Isn't necessarily familiar with like what well, they do, knows the basics, but never held a gun before, like not her thing. And so, yes, she gets the gun. And now she now goes up here and starts to lecture, starts to talk. The gun goes off, striking and hitting someone. She should have known. Right, for taking a gun, how to operate a gun. She should have known that, but she didn't. And that's where we have an issue. She didn't know. Right? She didn't know what guns do. She didn't know what harm they could cause. Like, she didn't know. She should have known, but she didn't know. Versus recklessly, which is more severe, where you should have known and you didn't give a damn. Right? Those are the can be very confusing. Um, again, recklessly, should have known, didn't care, negligently, should have known, but didn't know. All right, so again, this is even like you're looking at a gun, you're examining it, you're playing with it, and then it goes off and strikes somebody. You didn't mean for it to happen, right? And basically, everyone up there purposely, knowingly, is I didn't mean it to happen. Recklessly, I didn't mean it to happen. Negligently, I sure as hell didn't mean it to happen. But the only one where we have what you think of like additional intent is purposeful. The rest are we hope it didn't happen, like we didn't want it to happen. But because of the situation, we're criminally liable. So we move on. Question today. So that brings us to the next few requirements of a crime. Right? Concurrence, harm, causation, and attendant circumstances. So if we want to know about concurrence, concurrence basically says this is the third requirement. The evil mindset, whatever the statute says, whether it's recklessly, purposefully, whatever, evil mindset. And the act occurred in some days. Right, so you couldn't like sit here in class, and be like, ah, I'm going to run over this fat ass, and then like getting in the car, forgetting all about class, pumping out your music on your Taylor Swift and all that shit, and you're just jamming out the stereo and be like creepy as fuck. Like, like that's just crazy. But like, and then, you know. But you're just like jamming out screaming, and yeah, man, feel the sweat feel like dudes. And you start to back up, you don't realize I'm behind your car, and you run over me. And you committed murder. Murder requires a purpose to kill me. Or she was thinking about killing me. Did she tell me what she was thinking about? 
Did she think about it when she was killing me? No. Right, so we would generally say that probably under the statute of crime has occurred. Because all of these generally have to be met before a crime is committed. All right, so that brings us to the fourth requirement. And this is a requirement in some cases. So not every case, but some cases. We need a harm. Right, we need a harm. I mean, think about murder. You can't commit murder without harming someone. Right? It, it just it doesn't happen. Can't commit murder without harming someone. Harm, harming someone. There's the harm. Right? You can't commit battery without physically touching someone. There's the harm. We want some kind of result from your crime. That's where we're looking for harm. Some result from your crime. Then we have causation. Causation is required. Well, especially when we have harm. And all we really need is actions rate and injury, right? But, or even actions rate, so we should apply those. But the thing about causation, there's two types cause and fact, and legal cause. Cause and fact is fun. Because you have to be both the cause and fact and the legal cause. But what's the difference? Cause and fact. Let's go back to George Bowman. Did Jordan or were Jordan's actions, any of Jordan's actions, the result of my death? Oh, yeah. Right? Like any action is a result of my death. What about Jordan's parents? Are Jordan's parents a part of my death? Or did something that led to my death? Did Jordan's parents do something that led to my death? Huh? Possibly. She's sitting right there. They did. They had sex. They made her. They had hooked up. Don't do this, by the way. Sound good time. It's mind bugs. Take your case and crack my months. You need to see what happened. I have heard big sex. But that being said, <laughs> Jordan's parents had not hooked up. I would still be alive. What about Jordan's grandparents? Are they a cause in fact? Absolutely. They had hooked up, which caused their parents to look up to We wouldn't have Jordan. He wouldn't have me dead. Cause and fact is freaking ridiculous. You can blame basically everything as a cause and fact. Legal cause was, was it reasonably foreseeable? Like that's what we're asking. Was it reasonably foreseeable? So again, going back to Jordan, when her parents hooked up, was it reasonably foreseeable to her parents that one day she was going to go off on a crazy ass rage and kill a fat criminal justice professor. I don't think they said that before they engaged in the active population. If they did, we we'll would have a whole other discussion because they're fucking like prophets. Um, like, a lot of numbers of do this here. But that's where we're at, right? So it's reasonably foreseeable. That being said, it's 2.15, this class will finish up with talking about our equation of crime and what you see is we are building an equation and then we will jump into modern criminal law.